Hi, I'm Alan Ross. I'm the managing editor of APC Technologies. We are at the IEEE PES Grid Edge Conference, one of the sponsors of these interviews. Our other sponsors are Dynamic Ratings and H2Scan. Enjoy these interviews. My next guest is Bob Fyrer. Bob Fry, my best friend in Atlanta, but you are Bob Fyrer and I just met you. Bob, thank you for joining us. You're with DuPont. We're going to get into uh, a little bit more about what you do because you're in a part of DuPont that I happen to love, so I'm a shill for you, all right? But tell me a little bit about your background. How did you get into the industry? So I've been in the industry about 20 years, Alan. Um, started out with rotating equipment and then gradually came over to the insulating systems. You, you started with rotating, rotating equipment okay. with pumps and motors. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then for the past 15 or so years, I've been focusing on insulation systems okay. uh, for primarily motors, generators, and transformers. Okay. So you're with the Nomex division of DuPont. Yep, I'm part of the electrical infrastructure group, and I also have a dual role with our automotive EV group, uh, focusing on e-motors. Right, okay. We're gonna to get to that in a little bit, but talk to me about, um, the first question is, everybody I've asked to define the grid edge has defined it differently. So you get to define the grid edge. Tell me what it is. So from our perspective, it's, we're looking at the grid edge, anything from the generation to the consumption of energy. You just took so, the whole grid into it. We, we're really looking at, at the two edges. Um, you have the front edge where you're actually generating and then we also participate out where, whether it be residential, commercial, or industrial, where the actual usage is happening. And I would have said 20 years ago, at the generation side, that wouldn't have been considered grid edge. Today, the generation side, wind and solar, is grid edge, right? I think yeah. because of all the changes between your, your fossil fuels, between your natural gas, the coal-fired plants, changing over to your wind and solar, and potentially other future energies, uh, I think we have to really look at the generation side because I think that really comes in as an important part uh, going forward. So the, uh, the, the, all of this added, like electrification, transportation, wind, solar, storage, all of that is changing the grid in itself. It's gone from a step down grid to a step everywhere grid, right? What are the problems that that creates for your customers? So I think the biggest problem for our customers right now, and primarily on the transformer side, um, is purely a supply and demand problem. And it's a, it's a two-pronged supply and demand problem. Um, as the electrification happens, as AI, data centers, cryptocurrency all come into play, there's a lot more energy usage going on. There's more and more consumption, and there's going to be no end to that. Um, with the consumption, you have to have more generation more generation capacity. You have to transmit, you have to distribute. The transformer manufacturers right now, what they're seeing is trying to keep up with the demand of growing our grid, growing the actual infrastructure behind the energy to, to get it out to the use points. Which is two parts, replacing aging equipment, which we were just in the beginning, we were just starting to do most of that because that aging equipment is now Average tra power transfer in the United States is 40 years old. I was going to say 40 to 50 years old. Right. It's probably so, time. It's time to replace those, but now you have to add to it. Um, and I don't think that the capacity from a lot of the OEMs has been there historically, because it hasn't had to be. So what's happening now is they're trying to reinvest in their own businesses, and even trying to get the equipment that they can manufacture more equipment is a challenge for them. Uh, some equipment that they may expect in January may not arrive until July or August of that year. Um, therefore, it pushes their lead times out as well. So it's, it's kind of a cascading effect through the industry. Yeah, somebody just remarked earlier that the lead times for power transformers has doubled. I mean, it, it just it's created this massive problem. And we're not bringing on a lot more manufacturing globally. And we're limited to some parts of the globe that we really don't want to buy transformers from, just from a security standpoint. Sure, so sure, absolutely. It's the perfect storm. Uh, it truly is. One of the things I, I had said, if I, were, if I were buying a transformer today, if I were specking it, I would spec a transformer that used, um, so I'm going to name names, FR3 or okay. some synthetic sure. or natural ester, okay. Nomex from DuPont, with, and I would want the high heat Nomex, I would want the best of the best because I need that transformer, the new one, to last as long as the old ones. They're half the size than they used to be. 
So you have a lot of issues going on here. How do you address it? Bring up a great point there, Alan. And it's something that I I think we really need to look at going forward. So picture this scenario. New York City back in the 1960s when a transformer was built. Picture the energy consumption in a specific part of Manhattan, say. A transformer was designed and built in the 60s for that. Picture the energy consumption now versus then in that same block. That transformer needs replaced. They don't have any more real estate to put that transformer. It needs to maintain the same footprint, but they need to get so much more power out of it. So what's gonna happen? They're gonna have to build a transformer that runs at higher temperatures, can take higher loads, and with the variability can can overload. Well, that lends itself right down to bringing in exactly as you said, the, the high temperature materials such as Nomex, where the benefits of putting the Nomex in when you do overload your transformer, you're not gonna reduce your life. We have proved the aging of Nomex. It helps with with the transformer overload. And when you do overload it, your life expectancy isn't gonna be reduced drastically like some of the other materials. Um, The other thing is it allows it to run at a higher heat. It can run hotter. Therefore, you can keep it in that same footprint and not have to pay a couple million dollars for more real estate. Which, which you can't even get anymore. You, you so, can't get yeah, at all, right. right. Uh, do, do you see a lot of people using, uh, doing something different for vault transformers, underground vault transformers, than they're doing for uh, above ground So I have, I have very limited yeah. um, involvement in the underground transformers in the vault. Um, we did a, a little bit of a study about a year ago um, where we looked at, at some solid insulation distribution transformers. Um, and th- there are some new technologies that are happening there. I'm not very familiar with what it is because a lot, some of them do have Nomex in them. Um, but where we're primarily focusing right now, our, our growth segments um, is the EV charging network and the data center networks. Okay, two things I want to go to, Great. because part of the thing that defines the grid edge is wind, solar at the grid edge, which is now generation, storage for wind, solar, but also storage in the home, um, and obviously electrification of transportation. It's the big buzzword here. Everybody's talking about it. In fact, the the, uh, the opening segment this morning, that kind of became, that wasn't what they were supposed to talk about, but it seemed like everybody <laughs> talked sure. about okay. what, what's happening, because it's such a rapid, large-scale change to the grid that I don't think we fully grasp what that means. What does it mean to you all? So I actually saw a very interesting presentation um, back in one of our RIEEE meetings where somebody had actually quantified the effect of EV charging on the residential network. And rough numbers had guesstimated about 10,500 kilowatt hours per year is what you would use in your home, average, average home. Um, in, in the U.S., and if you added charging your EV, it would be about a 40% increase on your electricity demand per year if you were charging your car at home. That's one vehicle charging. Now, if each home goes to two vehicles, obviously that will probably double. So we're increasing our demand on our grid and on our equipment, our distribution equipment, your, your pole side transformers by 40%. Were they sized for that? 20 years ago when they were put in, 40 years ago when they put in. So when we start to really quantify it and add numbers to it, it becomes a very interesting math equation. Um, And then the question becomes, okay, what do we do about that? It's coming. The the EVs are coming. It's great technology. All these manufacturers are doing a fantastic job developing the technology. It's a matter of how fast we can charge, where we can charge, and what it's going to take to get the network there. You know, and it goes right through again, goes from your generation, can we generate the electricity that we need for it? You know, if we're shutting down certain fossil fuels, is there enough generation capability coming online and wind and solar to not only replace that, but to handle the increase that we have? And then our existing lines that are out there and transformers and substations, can they process that? And I think that's, it's a lot of math that needs to be done and there's a lot of people that are doing a great job with it. But actually getting the equipment is now the challenge. Yeah, no, that, that, because therein lies the rub when you're trying to rebuild a network. I I liken it to we're flying a 
a 737 from New York to Los Angeles. Okay. When we land, it has to be a 747. <laughs> and you can't land anywhere in between. Right. It's a very complex situation that the, those of us in engineering, we, we're looking at it going, oh, good luck, guys. Figure it out. Because we're looking at people smarter than us that we're the old school guys. Make a case for Nomex specifically. So it's actually a very, very easy case for Nomex, in my opinion. And, I, and yes, I'm biased. Um, Nomex is the premier high temperature insulating material in the world. Um, DuPont is the leader in developing materials, whether they're Nomex, Kapton, Tyvek, a lot of great brands out there, but specifically with the Nomex brand, everything is trending towards higher temperatures, needing the ability to overload, um, needing the ability to shrink a footprint down. When we start to look at all of that, we really start to bring the Nomex brand into it. Um, it's the only UL rated, component rated, 220C material in the market as far as insulating paper. That's kind of nice for you to it's, have, it's right? a, the it's only a of something. It is, and there's some competitors out there that are, that are nipping at our heels, and we're, we're very cognizant of that. Um, but we also know that we have a great brand. Um, and everybody starts to look at price, and we're doing a lot of due diligence um, with analyzing and testing competitive products. And we can make the case that even though Nomex is historically viewed as a high price product, we can actually make the case that it may actually be less. Your overall cost of operation, your overall total, cost, cost, of, of total cost of ownership is where we want to go. It's going to be less and it's a very quick payback on it. I am a reliability guy, certified reliability leader, certified maintenance and you know, CMRP, so I'm passionate about reliability. And we in the reliability industry are trying to move away from cost to total cost of ownership. And in almost every instance, and we're talking about rotating equipment, we're talking about electrical equipment, uh, conveyors, whatever you're talking about, almost in every interest we, in, instance we can make the, the case that if you look at TCO, you will always make a decision to buy the better product, always. Partly because we're also dealing with weather events that are changing how assets are viewed and used and how do we get them. We, we have one of our, we have to do a panel of uh, CEOs of OEMs, transformer manufacturers. One of them uh, is opening a new plant in Chihuahua and I, it's in May, We're, it's April right now in 2023, he opens in May, he sold out. That's the only new plant in North America that I know about. I know there's some expansion. There's a lot of expansion. Yeah, yeah. but it, it, is, it is a huge problem for the industry that needs more to replace, but needs more new. And uh, it seems to me that you wouldn't buy next generation problems. You wouldn't buy something that's going to have the next generation say, crap, I wish they'd have bought, I wish they'd have done it right. Right. I mean, you look at the, look at your historic large companies in, in the U.S., your, your GEs, your DuPonts, your Dows, they're never the low cost option, but they're the option that's always around, that's been here for 40 and 50 years. And there's a, there's a reason for that. Um, we start to talk about expansion of plants. Um, many of the transfer room, transformer OEMs that I'm working with and that I talk to on a routine basis, they have room for expansion. One of their challenges is labor. And there's, there's an interesting, uh, just talking to a few of them, some of them have great ideas on what they're doing and how they're trying to get more labor. Um, they're working with local community colleges, trade schools, creating programs specific to what they need, to winders, to machinists. And they're actually reaching out proactively to the educational institutions. I think going forward, what does everybody want in this world? They want a steady job that they know is gonna be here and that they're gonna have an income and be able to pay their bills. Sure, we'd all like to make a million dollars. But if you have a steady job to raise a family, that's a win in most cases. And this industry's not going anywhere. The transformer manufacturers, the motor manufacturers, the power generator manufacturers, they're all steady jobs and they're all pretty good paying jobs. So they're starting to market to the masses with that. And I think it's a great idea with, that these guys are doing.
Yeah, we just did this at the uh, NIDA conference, uh, National Electric Testing Association, okay. which is actually international now, but it's still NIDA. They are, they are the uh, standards organization for electric testing. Okay. And um, they, uh, they'll be announcing it soon. We've already done these interviews, so we announced it. <clears throat> They're gonna have an apprenticeship program um, Department of Labor approved apprenticeship program for electrical testing people. Uh, yeah, first one in a long time. Uh, as a member of the SMRP, which is Society of Maintenance and Reliability Pro uh, Professionals, we went to Washington and we uh, lobbied on behalf of the Perkins Act, which um, when Donald Trump was president, it was the only legislation that was unanimously passed in the House unanimously passed in the Senate, signed by uh, President Trump. Uh, I mean, think about that. We've never heard of anything that, sure. we, that, that they agreed it on. Went right through. The Perkins Act did $5 billion to go to trade schools, to because we closed them all. We, right. got, we got it out of high school right. and apprenticeship programs. That's fantastic. Uh, and that's a start. But we it need is. to be spending $10 billion a year, not one lump $5 billion right. Right. thing. But last, I want to ask you, uh, Nomex in, is working on insulation for other parts, not just transformers, right? Sure. T talk a little bit about Nomex elsewhere. So one of the other fast growing markets, obviously with the EV charging comes the electric vehicles. Um, we're working with the e-motor manufacturers, whether it be the automotive OEMs, the tier one manufacturers, uh, as slot insulation. Um, Nomex in a motor, whether it be in a discrete or a laminate format, um, is primary slot insulator in these e-motors. Um, it's a completely different world, completely different manufacturing method, um, one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I kind of grew up in the motor industry. Um, and it's, a, it's an exciting, exciting type of industry. And, and what these young de design engineers are coming up with and what they're asking for is fantastic. And the nice part about it, and one of the reasons, whether it be on the transformer side and the electrical infrastructure, or whether it be on the e-motor side, DuPont has the resources. We have the experience, we have the people, we have the R&D to support it. Yeah, the uh, we, have, we have the global footprint, but more so we have the people. Our biggest strength, that, besides our, our materials, is our people. And we have some people that have been around a long time that are very, very bright people, and I'm fortunate to work with them. Um, they make my job a lot easier. One of your senior engineers, we did a, a when we were in COVID, we did a Zoom interview <clears throat> with him and, um, I, I, he came up with this, but I actually, I said, so Nomex is moving away from being a product to being an application, which is completely different because as an application, you can go in other places, uh, you'd make the product to meet the needs of the application, but that sounds like what's happening there. It's a good time to be responsible for the growth of Nomex. It's, I, I'm fortunate I get to travel North America, I get to see all the transformer manufacturers, the motor manufacturers, and, and get to really deal with some wonderful people out there. And So in uh, December, our, our APC Technologies always creates, our annual December issue is, it used to be oils and fluids. I changed it to be insulating systems, oils and fluids. Now it became a December, January issue because we have so much content, we can't put it in one issue. Um, I want to find one of your great engineers that can talk about the application for Nomex um, and, and why it's important beyond just Transformers and we, we we'll have, publish it in December. We have two guys that have been with Nomex for 40 years that either one of them would be perfect for you. Uh, name one of them. Roger Wicks. Roger. Wayne Abernathy Roger? would be the other. Yeah, okay. I, I don't know Wayne, but I do know Roger. Yeah. So uh, get Roger to write an article on the value of uh, in, in insulating systems, I'd love to see him put more emphasis on uh, automotive, on, on motors, on rotating. Absolutely. Okay, we, we we'll can do get it. him to do it. Thank you so much, Appreciate Bob. It. Appreciate it. All right, thank you.